She's got the whole class. Why the whole class with toys? Toys with hey, Pat, can you see the slides okay? Good. All right. Good. Good morning. Good morning. Looks like everybody uh, thought the, that we were canceled because of snow. <laughs> what snow? We there's not snow? much. There's not much advantage of doing it on Zoom, except for you never cancel. <laughs> That's true. No snow days. If your power was out, Bob, I think you might have to cancel then. <laughs> well, that's true. Fortunately, <laughs> I haven't lost any power. Right. Very, very fortunate. See if some more folks will come. Let's just see who's here. Okay, oh there's 20 people. All right. Okay, I'm going to get started. Oh, I can't see that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle them fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful to the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same spirit to have right judgment in all things, and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll be right back. I'll close the door. If I don't close the door, Beverly gets a big echo downstairs. All right, I promise I will not take a long, long time but again, I just suddenly thought I need to go a little bit outside of where we are to set the stage for what we're doing. And I, I, I just got this idea that we needed to, to ask a question. I needed to ask a question. And the, the question is, although it didn't come up the way I wanted it to, um, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said to them uh, up in Galilee, he gathered the, the apostles together and all the synoptic gospels talk about, it, I believe. And he said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me and therefore go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you till the close of the age. That was his commission to the apostles. 
And that applies to every one of us on this Zoom and everybody we that are in our parish and in the church. That's our mission. So my question is, if you probably haven't thought about it, what would you tell someone? If I said, uh, uh, if Tim came to me and, and, he, and he said, I have a really good friend and I've known him many years. We served in the army together for all those years and he, he's retired like me and, we're, and we're, he's just suddenly thought about some sort of faith. He said he's been basically an agnostic. I mean, he didn't disbelieve in God, but he never had time for God. He didn't have any time for church. It wasn't important to him. And now he's getting older and, and he'd like someone to come and talk to him about the faith. Well, let's say he was an atheist, or let's say he was a Protestant. I have a, I have a Protestant. Um, he's seen what you do when you go to Mass, and he's curious about it. What would you go and tell? Now, I was thinking, if this had been happening to me as a Protestant, as a young person, and someone said, what would you go to, to explain about the, about the Methodist Church that would attract people? I guess, since I was never trained in any of that, never thought much about it, I, I would just basically talk about the, 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 the personality of the minister, the, the message that he gave, the beautiful choir that we had, the organ, our, our church, how wonderful it was to come together as, as family and hear a good homily about how to live week to week and, and, and the prayers the, and, and, and going to Sunday school. I, 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 I tell him about going to Sunday school because that's where I got an overview of the New Testament. I learned about Jesus. It'd be wonderful. That's about all I would know. Now, if you were a Catholic and you grew up a Catholic all your life, I don't think you would really have, you, you might say, well, uh, depending on how you saw it, some of you might say, well, I've had to go to Mass every every Sunday for all of my life. It's mandatory. And, and we also were required to go to confession once a year. And, you know, it's kind of, there's a box and you, there's, you go and you kneel in this box and there's a priest and you tell him your sins. I, you know, it's, and then all the rituals and, and it, it could be very boring. Or if you really were excited about one aspect of it, you say, well, I'm in the Legion of Mary. We, we've got this wonderful prayer group and we meet and we pray to the Blessed Mother and we, we, we learn about her and all that she's done. And maybe some of the men's would say, well, I'm in the Knights of Columbus, a really cool men's club. But whatever it is, what would you really need to go out and, and say to attract a person to the faith? And what I wanna show you is that it's not changed. And it's been there from the beginning because that's what Paul is doing. Paul is going out first to the Jews. Jesus came to the house of Israel. He was rejected by them. Then he opened up to the Gentile world. Paul is going out to the Jews. He's being rejected by all but a few. And then he's going out to the Gentile world and he's leaving them this information. So what was it that he was leaving? We've looked at this before, but I want to send this to you again. So you'll have this as a reference. So if you want to think about how you would go about it, you would have some sort of a reference. All right. The things the apostles had and Paul was preaching, we call the kerygma. We don't have the document. There is no document of the kerygma. We do not have an outline of what Jesus left the apostles. They all understood. They lived with him for three years. They understood the essence of what he had to say. And they went out and verbally transmitted this to the people until eventually, some 30, 40 years later, um, four uh, gospel writers, well, th three, the, the Synoptic Gospels writer wrote a kind of a summary of it, if you will, the highlights for their respective audiences. One were the Jews in Israel, the other were the Roman citizens, the people in the Roman church in Rome, and the third one was all the people in the diaspora, which is Luke. And then, of course, John came along and he wrote it much, much later, around the beginning of the second century. But they came up with some body of information, some cohesive message that, that Christ inspired them through the Holy Spirit to go out and proclaim that would attract people. People would listen to that and say, wow, that makes sense. Gosh, I never thought about that. Oh, I'd really like to do that. So what else did they have? They had the Apostles' Creed. And then we found they had the Didache, which is really the first catechism, if you will. And of course, they had the celebrations. They had the baptismal celebrations right from the get-go. The sacrament of baptism was part of the ritual. And that was the sacrament of initiation. And of course, they also had the Eucharist coming from Holy Saturday, Holy Thursday night with the apostles in the upper room where Christ gave them the breaking of the bread and the, the blessing of the wine and the bread in his body, blood, and soul and divinity. 
So these were the things that they had and were practicing. And these were the things they were going out and instilling in the people in these churches. Now the kerygma we see, uh, basically it was the promise that God had made in the Old Testament. So this is really for the Jews. Now the, the Gentiles had heard about the Old Testament. They had Jews among them. They understood a little bit of that. So this was the promise that God had given in the Old Testament that was being fulfilled. The Messiah did in fact come, the long awaited Messiah, 500 years. And it was this Nazarene carpenter. He was the Messiah, he was a rabbi. Second, his authority, he was anointed by God as the long awaited anointed one, Messiah, Meshach. He began his ministry in Galilee, Galilee after his baptism. He conducted a lot of good deeds, mighty miracles. He was crucified, according to the Old Testament tradition, that it would happen and, 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 and to complete the purpose of God. He was raised from the dead. Are you kidding me? What does this mean to the Jew and Gentile? We're going to see that in Paul's letters uh, throughout his letters. That's challenge to the Jews and the challenge to the Gentiles about his being killed. The Jews couldn't believe the Messiah would be killed. The Gentiles couldn't believe that anybody wanted to be raised from the dead. He was exalted by God, given the name Lord Kyrios. He was given the Holy Spirit to form a new community, or he gave us, and he'll come again. At our judgment, all of us from all time, and all those who should hear his message, what should you do? You should repent. And after you've repented, you should be baptized and brought in to the, into the, uh, the ecclesia, the gathering of the church. The 12th, Articles of the Apostles' Creed, we say, were a summary of their faith. So again, we see this same continuity. Listen to it. The tradition of the Middle Ages that each, each uh, the Holy Spirit influenced each one to write a separate uh, passage of the 12 statements. But it's like a prayer. It's like the rosary. It was expanded later, as we know, into the Nicene Creed. Here it is. What does it say? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and his Son, the Son of God. That's what Paul's going to talk about. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And then he descended into the dead and one third day rose again. Paul says this. And he ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge us at our death. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Catholic Church, meaning universal forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Paul's going to talk about that. He talked about that to the Thessalonians. And life everlasting. What are, what are the qualities of the apostolic fathers? These were the ones that followed the apostles. These are the men who were taught by the apostles who have written documents that we have copies of today to show the beginning of this infancy of this faith that was moved as it moved out. From around 80 to 100, St. Clement followed Peter, Ignatius of Antioch followed John, Polycock followed John, and we see from them the Didache. A brief, if you will, treatise, catechism, some Greek manuscript discovered, a hard copy in 1873. We had known it was there for a long time. We'd never seen it. But then in 1873, it was found the oldest surviving written catechism uh, in the church. And it gives the ethics of the church and the baptismal and Eucharistic rituals. Although it's anonymous, it's considered to be part of the second generation of Catholic known as the Apostolic Fathers, which we say, and it contains, it can be divided into uh, the two ways, the way of life and the way of death, the ritual of dealing with baptism, fasting, and communion, the ministry and how to deal with traveling prophets, and a brief overview of, of the apocalypse. So this is what they had. What do we have? <laughs> we have this. This little book. So if you just take this little book and you study it and you memorize it and you learn everything in it, then you can go out and you can proclaim the kingdom to all your friends and neighbors. It's all in here, everything you need to know. My gosh. Beverly grew up in the pre-Vatican church and Beverly was taught the Baltimore Catechism. The Baltimore Catechism was based on the four pillars of the Catechism of Trent. I guess the Catechism of Trent is the most modern catechism before this one, which was in 1995, I think is when this one came out. 
So she went through a process that basically as a Catholic school student, they were taught all the way through high school, the fundamentals of the Baltimore Catechism, which was a question and answer. It took the teaching and said, what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a sign instituted by Christ to give grace. So you memorize the answers. And that was very good because it was structured and it gave you. So you could ask a Catholic of Beverly's age, what is it that your faith teaches you? And she could probably answer a lot of it from the Baltimore Catechism. We're losing that. Here are the four pillars of the Baltimore Catechism. It deals with the profession of faith. That's the Nicene Creed. It believes in Christian ministry. That is the moral life. Then the life in Christ and finally Christian prayer. Those are the four major components of the catechism. Now, when I went to graduate school, and Beverly, I went to graduate school, we had everyone in the entire graduate school program had to take three classes. One was God the Father, one was God the Son, one was God the Holy Spirit, and it was right out of this catechism. It was right out of the teachings of the church that everybody had been getting, been, been, been receiving since Beverly was a child. It was those same fundamental teachings. It was what Second Vatican Council was all about. Three of the documents in Second Vatican Council, one dealt with the church in the world, one dealt with how the church saw itself in, in its worship, and one dealt with Holy Scriptures. Those are the three major documents of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. Again, reiterating all this that has been come forward. And lastly, what I want to show you is this is the little book that we use, The Faith Explained. I mentioned it to you before. Um, it's a wonderful little overview of the faith. And in it, it has four parts. The creed, the commandments, sacrament and prayer. I mean, I'm sorry, it has three, but it encompasses the four that we just saw in the catechism. There's 39 chapters. What is it that we're telling the converts? What are we telling the people that come to RCI? Here are the 39 chapters. This is under the creed. We're talking about God the Father. The purpose of man's existence, God in his perfections, the unity and trinity, creation of angels, creation and fall of man, actual sin. And then we talk about the Son, the incarnation and redemption. Then we talk about the Holy Spirit and grace, virtues and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then we talk about the Catholic Church, marks and attributes of the church, the communion of saints and the resurrection of life everlasting. That's the Nicene Creed. Then we give them the commandments. The first two great commandments, the first commandment, the second and third, fourth and fifth, sixth and ninth, seventh and tenth, eighth, and the commandments of the church. So we teach them the moral life. And then we look at the sacraments and prayer. What are the sacraments? And then we look at baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, mass, holy communion, penance, contrition, confession, temporal punishment, indulgences, anointing the sick, holy orders, matrimony, and then we look at sacramentals, which are signs instituted by the church to give grace. They're things like a cross or a rosary. And then we talk about prayer, the Our Father, and then we talk about the Bible. That's what the RCIA contains. And it all comes from what we're looking at. It all starts with Paul. These are the things that he was teaching the people in Philippi, in, in Caesarea, in Thessalonica, in Ephesus. That's what these letters start out with. And it was very interesting. I was reading through uh, the, the teachings of Father Gardini in the Lord, and he was talking in one of his uh, chapters, he was talking about uh, Jesus and the apostles when he gave them this mission. And here's what he said. He said, before sending them, meaning the apostles the first time, this is when before he gave them the power to forgive sins. He gave them the power to do um, miracles, but not forgive sins until after the resurrection. But before he sent them out the first time, he tells them exactly what they're to do. And he gives them rules by which they must live. And he said, go look at Mark chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 10. That will tell you where, what Jesus gave them to do. I'll just give you a little bit of idea of Mark 6. He said, he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits, charged them to take nothing on the journey except a staff and so on. He said, if any places will not receive you, then refuse to hear you, then shake the dust off your feet and move on. Then he said, the apostles returned and told him that all that they had done. And he said to them, come away yourself to a lonely place and rest for a while. So he's giving them exactly what they were to do. And Matthews is even more detailed, telling them what they were to do. And he said, the whole sense of Christian teaching is based on Christ's living command, and it's contained in the scripture from 
And it's from there that we take our departure and we must constantly return. That's what we're studying. That's why you come to Bible study. So you can get this early message that has never changed. He said he gives his parting disciples instruction valid for all times. Everything depends upon the authority behind the teaching. Remember, people were amazed at Jesus. They said he taught, he taught with such authority. I've never met anybody who had authority. Like scribes and Pharisees don't come near the authority of this man. When, when Jesus was teaching in the, in the temple and, and, um, um, and, and the guards were sent to, to and when Jesus was one of the apostles teaching to arrest him, uh, they came back and said, we couldn't arrest him. We've never heard anybody talk like that without authority. He said the apostles, rece the apostles received power to heal sick, cleanse leper, cure possessed, raise the dead. And he said miracles were to be used because of those who had not yet believed needed a sign. So what do we do? We have signs in our scripture, in our teaching that can help someone believe. Look, look at this mighty deeds. Look at these things that are happening. We prayed over this person. The whole Bible studies prayed for this person and got completely well. That's a sign that we can use. He said, Christ's message challenged men to free themselves from the earth's natural bonds. The one is ready to do so and the other is not. When he went out and offered it to people, some accepted it, others rejected. He said, he who accepts this word receives it, in it, in it, in it with holy peace. He said, it's clear that it brings such tidings and uh, 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 such tidings Travels a day, he who receives such tidings travels a dangerous road. A disciple can be expect nothing better treatment than it happened to the master, and we know he was killed. So reading the gospel, we don't gain the impression that during Jesus' lifetime, the disciples really grasped his meaning. They didn't understand it. They didn't fully. They were still arguing on the way to Jerusalem for his crucifixion. He said the Lord had not privileged to live, there was not privileged to live among them. Um, among the people who understood him. He saw who he was in the goal before him. But again and again, situation would arise which show how utterly alone Jesus remained in their midst. How often are we struck by the smallness and narrowness and paltriness of the disciples' reaction? How often the heavy message is deg degraded to an earthly one. Involuntary, we wonder what might have happened had a great and daring man walked among the disciples and implemented what he had said. So that's from Gardini. So that's what I wanted to start with today is give you this, this desire to have a grasp of the faith so that you could go out and you would invite someone and make them so excited that they would want to come and join St. Raymond's or any other Catholic parish. Okay, last week we were looking at Galatians. We ended up the, ended, uh, our study of Galatians and we saw that, that um, as we looked at gen chapter three through six, we saw that uh, he wrote this book from Ephesus in the middle of his third journey. His third journey is from 53 to 58. And remember, he's writing the Galatians who had visited on the previous two journeys. The first journey is when he set up the first churches, and they were all in Galatia. Second journey, he went by and reinforced all of them and made sure everybody was still faithful. Now he's getting these letters saying that the Judaizers are driving the people crazy, and they're, they're beginning to practice Judaism, and they're playing with it, and they're really playing with fire. So that's why he writes this letter back. He, he preached the gospel of repentance and baptism. That's what you are to do. Believe in the new way, be repentant of your sin, and be baptism, and baptism forgives all sin. So again, Father pointed out that since uh, Paul had visited the Galatian churches four times, his letter only highlighted certain information. All this information that I'm talking about, he gave verbally. He did it in Thessalonica, but he got run out of town before he could finish that part about the second coming. But obviously, he talked about baptism. Obviously, he talked about forgiveness of sins. Obviously, he talked about some of these other things. So Father pointed out he, he was very frustrated when they had started believing the Judaizers. Now, again, Father pointed out in the letter to the Galatians, he's highlighting things that he's already taught in detail. But when we get to Romans, although we won't have time to study it in great detail, when we get to Romans, that's where he lays out his entire theology. Romans probably contains the most of the kerygma that there is because he didn't know them. And so he laid it all out. So again, he's in Ephesus. He had left the church in Corinth. And we're going to see when we get today 
that it was fairly easy for someone to get in a boat and cross the Aegean Sea and come to Ephesus and easy enough for him to go back. But he doesn't go back that way. He goes around the top again. It's a long, long way. But anyway, these guys come over by boat. Last week, we saw him relating the fact that Judaism, which started with Abraham, which demonstrated Abraham fa had faith well before the law. The law came hundreds of years later. So how can you say faith is based on the law when Abraham was attributed as one who had faith because he obeyed God and offered his son in sacrifice and was stopped by the angel, proving that he was a man of faith. That was way before the law. So the law doesn't give you faith. It's belief in God and his son, Jesus. He warned them, if you start playing with Judaism, you got to live all of it. You got to take the whole nine yards. You can't just put on a hanka, circumcise your kids and, and not eat pork anymore. You have to do all of them, all 613 rules and regulations. You got to go to pilgrimage to Jerusalem whenever you can. You got to do sacrifices. You got to you've got to go to Jerusalem and offer animal sacrifice all that. It's it's all or nothing. And you're giving up the graces that come from baptism, the graces that come from Christ and his death and resurrection. You're giving all of that up to revert back to what the Jews had before Christ came. And he was challenging them, don't play with it. You're playing with fire. And he said it's a yoke of slavery. And this whole idea of of, of law, uh, law versus good works and, and that sort of thing was misunderstood by Luther. But he said, this is the law of Moses versus the law of love. Jesus came to give us the law of love. A loving father sent his son to bring his love to the world. And he was very, very critical of those being circumcised. So now we're going to look at the next letter. So here he is in Ephesus, writing this letter off to the Galatians. He's getting them all, trying to get them turned around, get things squared away. So where does he have churches right now? He has churches in Thessalonica. He has churches at Philippi. Uh, he had very little success in Athens, so I don't think he had a church there. But he had a nice church in, in Corinth. He'd been there about 18 months. He really got that one set up. And suddenly, out of nowhere, we're going to get this arrival of this woman named Chloe and her friends and her followers. So the last time we saw Acts 18, we saw that, that Paul was in Ephesus. And we saw that he wrote his letter to the Galatians from Ephesus. And then shortly thereafter, this, this Christian group of Christian Corinthians, led by this woman named Chloe, uh, arrives in Ephesus with a letter. And this letter, we don't have a copy of it. We don't know exactly what it says. We have to assume it from his response. But this letter indicated there were some problems now. Now, again, think of the time frame. He established the church in Corinth sometime between 49 and 52. By 52, he was back in Jerusalem. So let's just say he started 18 months. Let's say he started 50, 50, 51, okay? We're now somewhere between 53 and 58. So we're talking two, three, four years later, four years have gone gone by four years of the people in the church in in um uh Caesar, in um corinth been ruled been been guided been directed by other people many of the people that paul may have set there and left had gone he certainly didn't leave timothy there and, and tight, those guys were moving around so so who was running these churches it's several years later and now they're finding that there is a problem. So she brings this letter. And again, she travels from Corinth by boat, most likely over to Ephesus. Now, it would appear that members of the Corinthian church weren't really confident that Paul was going to come back. He promised he'd come back. He said, I'll come back. And, and, and they were waiting for him. It's been, let's say it's been five years. Well, maybe he's never going to come back. We can't wait for him any longer. So we're going to send a delegation over to Ephesus. We know that's where he is right now. And we're going to send him this letter and say, what should we do about this problem? This problem is really causing us division. And that's what the letters to the Corinthians are all about. We're going to study the first Corinthians. We're going to very, very briefly look at second Corinthians because it doesn't, the first Corinthian letter doesn't solve the problems completely. But here's what's going on. 
There's a huge difference between the church in Galatia and the church in Corinth. What is it? Well, the church in Galatia, he went through four times. He went there and visited them, or he went and visited them three times. He established them, set them up. He came back on the second journey, came back on the third journey, and now he's written a letter to them. He knows them. They know him. He's catechized them. They're his children. He, he has spent many hours explaining in each of those four churches what his teachings are. They have the charisma. They know what Paul sent left them. So he can write a simple letter to them, and they would understand because they just fitted in to what they had already been taught and contrasted to what the Judaizers were demanding. But Corinth, he was only there once, five years ago. Yeah, he was there 18 months, but he hasn't had that same interaction between the people of Corinth as he had with the people of Galatia. So we need to look into the, Paul's letter as it responds to this crisis. And we hear this echo of Chloe's letter, although we don't know exactly what it says. But here's the problem that Father described as having happened in Corinth. And I'm telling you, I would have never understood these letters without this class. I, I would never have gotten to this point reading it myself. I would have never figured out what it was they were upset about. But Father did, and it's just amazing. So again, even though Paul was absent, um, the church seemed to be doing okay until certain heresies sprung up. They were beginning to develop this four or five years later. And here's what they're dealing with. First, since this church wasn't founded by on Judaism, since there weren't very many Jews in Corinth, like the other places where half of his preaching was to the Jewish synagogue and bringing Jews to the new way, and the other half was to Gentiles. Most of the people in Corinth were Gentiles. Almost most likely the whole Corinthian church was based on Gentile converts. Again, Gentiles coming from the Greek culture. So the biggest problem came from this culture, this Greek culture in a Greek city of Corinth. And it is what later became known by the scholars as Christian dualism. We've talked about this before, but I'm telling you, this, this is such an amazing thing. It was so prevalent all throughout the world. And almost all of these communities, particularly the Gentile communities, had this dualistic approach. Father said, even though there was a variety of religions, one place they worship Aphrodite, and next place they worship this person, they had this statue, and they worshiped this god, and so on. They all had an underlying theme that was very similar. And here's the theme. This is what so amazing. This is what I want you to remember. So almost all Greeks who were Gentiles believed that there were two, there were two kinds of gods in the world. There were good gods, and there were bad gods. And the good gods were those that created the spirit. And all people were born with a spirit and they came from uh, the, the spirit gods and they were spirit children. So your life was based on what you received as a spirit child from your spirit parents who lived in the spirits outside the world. Now the bad guys were those who made the material world everything in the world that was tangible was bad. The material world itself, including the earth, was bad. And he said the bad gods <laughs> created a body to become the tomb of the spirit's God's child, the spirit child. So I have a spirit within me that's entombed by my physical body, physical body created by the bad gods, spiritual body created by the good gods, and the bad gods are trying to entrap my spirit and weigh it down to the earth by putting me in a body on the earth. See how that works? So that's the image of their religion. A person's body was his prison, what was the prison cell, and the earth was his prison. This was in the in the Gentile culture. Now, the people in the church at Corinth had, had given that up and accepted the idea that 
Christ gave us as the tangible goodness of all things made, that God created the heaven and the earth, all of it was good. We saw it in the, in the creation story and so on. But somehow these, these other leaders that were coming in from the Gentile community, they were saying, well, this new way is okay and it's fine, but remember, remember, your body is made by the bad guys. And the whole object is to get, get to heaven, get, get the, the spirit out of, out, of death, out of the body. So for the Gentile salvation meant that the spirit at death would be released from their bodies and from the earth so that their spirit could float up to the clouds and be reunited with their spiritual parents. Now you're a Gentile, you've grown up with this, what you believe all your life. That's what all your parents, everybody's saying, oh man, I can't wait till, I'm that, till I die. And then I can be with my spiritual parents. That would be just wonderful. I'll be happy. So when Christians started this preaching about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, it was like, are you kidding me? Who in the world would ever want to be reunited with his worthless, awful tomb body? Why would Jesus ever want to be raised from the dead? Why would we put his spirit back into his body after he died? That makes no sense to the G Greek, to the Gentiles. Hey, Bob, it's Ron Fouquet. Yeah. This seems kind of at odds with all the stuff I was taught way back when in college and high school about Greeks celebrating the, the beauty of form. Their sculpture was all about things like Adonis and Venus and etc how sure. beautiful the body form was yeah. but, but you're saying it's bad no i'm saying that the people in their faith believed that it was bad i i do think there's i mean there's all kinds of people in the culture and there's all kinds of philosophy and you're right the greeks did beautiful things and sculptures and that sort of thing but what father said is that the gentile religions whether they were worshiping aphrodites or some other god basically came from this general premise of dualism, a good God and a bad God. You even saw Plato said the body is a tomb of the soul. That's what he taught. So it was prevalent, but I'm, I'm, I can't explain why in art they had such a, a, a good uh, view of the body. I, I agree with you. I, I've seen their sculptures and that sort of thing. But uh, from what Father was telling me, the basic theological concept of, of life and death was what he has presented in this dualistic approach. It's a good question, though. I don't, I can't reconcile it. So he said, uh, sometimes they not only couldn't accept the concept of the resurrection, some of them could not even accept the concept of the incarnation. The word flesh in Greek was sarx. Sarx means flesh, and it means like your flesh, animal flesh. That's what made John 6 so difficult, because that's the word Jesus uses when he's describing eat my flesh. And the word eat there is the word for chewing, like a chow, cow chews cud. It really sounds cannibalistic. It really sounds difficult. Um, so you had the spirit, the pneuma, and then you had the sarks. And this is what no one could understand how the spirit could come become flesh. Incarnation. We love that word. We think, yes, the, the spirit of God became flesh like me and all things. But we're not seeing the flesh as the first century, as the early uh, Greeks saw it. So they just couldn't imagine anybody would want to return to their bodies after death. So these are the problems that the Corinthians saw, uh, what the scholars see as the message coming from Chloe and her people that was causing this division within the church uh, in Corinth. Now he said, <laughs> Father said, I think this is interesting. I, Father said, today there's still a lot of people who have this concept of Gnostic dualism. And I'll have to admit, I had never really thought, and I'm still grasping, trying to grasp at, at the resurrection of the body. I'm still, I'm not, I understand the resurrection of the body. And I understand at the second coming of Christ, we will all get a resurrected body. And I know you've already heard, told me that, that, that um, when Jesus comes back and I'm, issued my resurrected body, I've already put in a requisition that it be over six feet tall, because I'm tired of being short. So that's that, you know, I've always wanted to, to have a, a, a better resurrected body, but I don't understand exactly in the interim, because I sort of grew up with this 
theory that he points out. But when you think of it, if you've never thought of it, it it's 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 kind of dualistic. He said, at death, we have this idea that the soul leaves the body and floats up and and stands on a cloud and plays a harp. I mean, you know, art, we always see that some guy with a harp on a cloud. That's sort of this idea of the spirit going up to the clouds. But Father pointed out that salvation for a Christian should mean that when one dies before the second coming, and if they were baptized into Christ, they have received body and uh, his body and blood in the Eucharist, then we will be raised body and soul, obviously on the last day. I'm not sure what's in the interim, but that's why we're promised the body and soul. As I learned in theology, the angels are all spirit. God the Father is all spirit. Jesus was physical and spiritual. Man, human beings were created with a body and a soul, a spirit and a tangible physical body. And after the resurrection, the, the second coming of Christ, to be in our natural state, we will have a resurrected body to go along with our saved soul. So anyway, that's what we're looking for. That's what it's all about. So now we want to look at this story in 1 Corinthians with that in mind. I wanted to give you that background a little bit longer, but I want to give you the idea of what's going on. So when you hear some of these stories, you'll keep in mind there was this dualism going on. And some of the things that the people were told that they could do, contrary to what we listen to, we say, how in the world could they think of that? Well, keep in mind what the philosophy of the day was. So we want to look, I, I, Father did not have time to go through every, every verse, so I will skip a few verses, but I want to give you some highlights of uh, this chapter. So chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, again, is the opening, and, and Father wanted us to see this pattern of the opening. He said, uh, Paul called, uh, he's, this is the letter now he's sending back to Corinthians. This is the letter that's going to be read in the church of Corinth after Chloe goes back. She, she brings this thing, he writes a letter, I don't know if she took it back or whether it was sent by Timothy, I'm not exactly sure right now, but but this is the letter that's going to be read to the church in Corinth. It said, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and our brother Sothenus, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ, Jesus, and in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now, there's a little footnote there. Make a little note for yourself. That word there is not talking about someone in heaven. That's talking about Christians. The word saints was a common use of people who were part of the new way of the Christian faith at the time. So anyone who was a practicing Christian was considered to be a saint. So he said, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, meaning Christians, together with those who in every place call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And what does he say? Grace and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I give thanks to God always for you because of the grace of God, which was given to you in Christ Jesus. So he's praising them. He doesn't, he doesn't jump all over me. He doesn't say how stupid you are. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't say, even if an angel should come, what you believe is, you know, this is a loving response to a church that he really loves but he's going to address their problems in a second. So here we see he begins the thanksgiving. Uh, again, this grace was absent from Leonard Galatians because he was really upset. So he's again begins by addressing the fact that they were, there was a division in the church community. And they're not only slipping back into dualism, but, but it seems they have already help, they're being helped along by some of the people who were in leadership who are claiming authority from Jerusalem. And that's what goes on next and he says in verse 10 no i'm sorry uh so the, the rest of this one uh some state that that uh that they had been baptized or we saw let me just read that because it's no that's what we're going to read next okay so here's what he says in verse 10 i appeal to you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that all of you agree that there is no dissension among you, that there be no dissension among you. I appeal to you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all agree that there be no dissension among you, but 
that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For there have been reports to me by Cleo's people that there's quarreling among you, my brother. What I mean is that each one of you says, well, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Kephas, or I belong to Christ. Factions. Then he asks, is, is Christ divided? What's wrong with you? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I baptized none of you except Christmas and, and Gaius, lest anyone should say that you were baptized in my name. You were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You repented and were baptized in his name, not mine, not Peter's, not Titus. And then he goes on, he's, just, he's really worried about this. You can just see him thinking, gee, did I baptize anybody else? Let me think. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Behold, beyond that, I, I don't know if, whether I baptized anyone else. So he's really concerned that they were seeking to identify their faith with who baptized them rather than the fact that baptism was in Jesus Christ. He said, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What? He didn't send you to baptize? We'll look at that in a second. And he said, I also was to preach the gospel, but not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are, being, who are perishing, but to us who are being saved by its power, of God. For it's written in Isaiah 19, 12, that's which this quotes from, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand a sign and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. And that's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is his argument. He said, some of you are saying you were baptized by, by Peter. Now, Father said it could be a faction that came from Jerusalem that tried to sway this. Anyway, these false apostles, these false teaching, were teaching the people in, in Corinth that it was okay to sort of slide back into their paganism, into their dualism. And what are they going to practice? They're going to practice cult prostitution, and they're going to eat meat offered to idols. Because that's what they did before. So their argument, these practices were okay, but it didn't matter. Why? Because the body doesn't matter. The body is material. The body is evil. You can do anything you want to your body. Because it's not of any consequence. Because only your soul is going to go up to heaven. He said some even tried to mistreat their bodies, and some even tried to destroy their bodies to prove they were irrelevant. So you had one group that fasted and hardly ate anything, and the other group was gluttonous. Because again, they were rejecting the idea of the divinity of soul and body. So Father pointed out that this was a great example of the historical accuracy of the letters when Paul says, well, I, I don't think I baptize anybody else. He said, someone's going to write a text like this, they wouldn't worry about the names of the people might have baptized. And again, as we know, Peter wrote in pen and ink on parchment, and if you can't make corrections. So once it's written, it's written. Father asked if, if Christ did not send Paul to baptize people, why did he baptize this, the, the, this one guy if he didn't send him to baptize? And this again is what I really love about Father Sebastian's teaching. He explains that this is a Semitic, Semitic way of speaking. It didn't mean that he didn't, he wasn't sent to baptize. It meant that that was not his principal mission. 
His primary mission was to preach the gospel. If you don't preach the gospel, there isn't going to be anybody to baptize. So it wasn't saying I wasn't supposed to baptize. All the apostles were going to baptize, but their primary mission was to preach the gospel. As you remember what happened in Jerusalem, in the early church, when the women of the diaspora, the, the, the widows of the diaspora weren't being fed properly, the apostles said, we don't have time to take care of this administrative problem. We're, we've got to preach the gospel. So they came up with the deacons. This is the exact same thing he's saying here. The apostles were sent to baptize all nations. We read that in Matthew a few minutes ago. They were now supposed to preach the gospel first. Paul was showing the order of operation. His primary job among the Corinthians was to preach the gospel, not to simply go out and baptize. And he said, there appear to be two groups of people that have influenced this early church. Paul and his companions at the beginning who preached the gospel and founded the church. And now there's a second group who's coming in and they're trying to baptize everybody in this new way. Unfortunately, the second group was misleading them and they were talking about dualism. Here he's talking about the power of the cross. Paul is saying that, that we learn salvation through the cross. And he said, salvation through the cross would be folly to the Gentiles. Why would anyone want to die on a cross? Why would any leader, why would we follow any leader who is considered a renegade who was murdered by the Romans? Wouldn't make any sense. So it's folly to them. And he pointed out that it was a bit difficult to understand because Paul now is really changing his style. And this is such, again, from scholarship, they know this. Paul was an educated Jew. Paul grew up in Tarsus. Tarsus had schools of philosophy and rhetoric. Corinth was a city with a school of philosophy and rhetoric. Remember when Paul went to Athens, when he started talking to people in the Necropolis, they came up and they, were, they wanted to hear this new philosopher. And he wanted to use great words and influence them and talk about the God. And, you know, you even worship an unknown God. And I want to talk to you about this. And, and then once he started talking about being raised from the dead, they said, oh, no, we're not interested in this. Now, now come back another day and walk away. But here he again, he's saying, I didn't come there preaching rhetoric. I didn't bring all my education. I didn't try to convey you convince you through my knowledge and my wisdom and my articulateness and my ability to, to speak in the language of a philosopher, because there might be someone greater than me that could speak better than me, then you would go to them. I spoke the gospel in plain and simple English, and now he is going to use rhetoric because he's trying to convince them that he does have that education. He is worthy of their following. He is as articulate and educated as any of these guys that have come to Jerusalem from Jerusalem with this new message. He said, if, if, if we must understand what was meant by the wisdom and power of God, Paul was saying that the cross, Jesus' death and resurrection would save them. That's what redeemed them, not knowledge, not wisdom, not philosophy not rhetoric. And so now he's beginning to use the language of a rhetorician. 22 through 25, he said, the Jews demand signs, the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, folly to the Jews, I just read this, but to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. So again, for the Jew, the fact that Messiah died meant he couldn't have been the Messiah. How could the Messiah die? For the Gentiles, to say that Jesus, the Messiah, was raised from the dead, made no sense, dualism. But Paul said those who were called to Christ was not a stumbling block or folly because he was the power and wisdom of God. This is the gospel that he preached, and it was wiser than men. The weakness of God, which was Christ crucified and risen from the dead, was stronger than anything men had to offer. Father said Paul's reasoning was amazing as he was trained in Greek rhetoric and philosophy. That's why Paul was speaking like this since he hadn't been it before. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 2. Chapter 2, 1 through 5. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words or in wisdom. 
for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling and my speech and my message were not plausible words of wisdom, but, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul told the Corinthians that when he first came to Corinth on the second mission journey, he wasn't using this lofty language. He didn't want, these people are not philosophers. These are not the educated people that he brought into the church. These are not the intelligentsia and the elite. These were common people. So he used common language. He wasn't trying to, trying to blow them away with his great rhetoric. He was speaking to them um, uh, in, in simple language. He told them that he did that earlier because he didn't want their faith to be based on human wisdom and rhetoric. He wanted to be based on the spirit of God. Even though Paul was an example of Greek philosophy and rhetoric, he knew it, he used simple language. But it dealt with the power of God, which was found in this simple language. He did this to ensure that someone more versed in Greek couldn't come along after him and say, well, Paul said that, but this is a greater Greek and this is more philosophical, so you need to follow me. And he also knew that no one would speak the power of God unless he was an apostle. So only the apostles could speak with the power of God. He pointed out that First and Second Corinthians were filled with Greek rhetoric and philosophy, so he could counter the false teachers. But not in the beginning. But now we're going to begin to see it. He said, "The false teacher statement that Paul was a fool and didn't know what he was talking about is the reason he's using this language now. At the time, to imply that someone did not know philosophy meant he wasn't educated." Paul said, "Yeah, I'm educated. I was educated in." In uh, Tarsus, I went to the great schools of Tarsus. I graduated from the school of rhetoric and philosophy. This meant that Paul was a major threat to these false teachers when he demonstrated his expertise in their field of education. Father pointed out in 1 Corinthians 18.31 is an example of this language. That means the more philosophical language. Most people don't know this. You, you just skim over it. You read it. And you say, oh, I, but if you're a Bible scholar, you realize there's a shift in language here. And he's using rhetorical language and he's using philosophy. It's why it's a little bit harder to read, but he's doing it for the purpose. We have to understand the, intent, the definition of the terms that he was using and following them um, in the problems of the church. Paul came and founded this church. Apollo came and watered it. Now someone else is trying to destroy it by their rhetoric. Paul was presenting his warning in the next chapter. So we skipped over 6 through uh, 16. So let's go ahead and look at chapter 3, and then we'll, we'll end with that. In chapter 3, Father skipped over uh, what I just said. He, he talks about it a little bit further down. He said, I belong to Paul. Another said, I belong to Apollos. He said, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe the Lord assigned each. I planted, Apollos watered. Christ made the seed grow. But what Father stressed in this one was um, verse 16 through 23. I mean, sorry, 16, yeah, through 23. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If, any, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy in that temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is folly with God. It is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. That's from Job chapter um, five, verse 13. So let no one boast of men for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Kephas or the world of life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God. 
So again, we're seeing here Paul giving a stern warning. Be very careful concerning what you're doing, especially as it relates to these leaders. Well, I'm going to do one more, four. Chapter four, he deals with verse eight through 21. But, but I, I'd like to read the first part of it because it's really interesting how he talks about it. That Father didn't have much notes on this, but chapter four, verse one, he said, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. But for me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring the light to things that are now hidden in the darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then every man will receive his com com commendation from God. I have applied all this to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brethren that you may learn from us not to go beyond what's written. None of you may be puffed up in a favor of one against another. For he who sees anything different in you, what have you that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? And then he gives the part that we have a little bit of notes on, and that's uh, 8 through 21 said, already you are filled. Already you've become rich. Without us, you've become kings. And would that did you reign so that we might share the rule with you? For I th think that God has exhibited us that has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we become the spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. The present honor we hunger and thirst. We're ill-clad, buffeted by homeless. We labor, work with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become and now are, are now as the refuge of the world, the off-scourging of all things. I do not write this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as your as my beloved children. For though you have countless guilt in Christ, you have not, you, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ, uh, in Christ Jesus, came your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Therefore, I send you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child, in the Lord to remind you of the ways of Christ as I teach them everywhere in the early every church. Some are arrogant as though they were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon. And if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of those arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love? in the spirit of gentleness. So chapter four pointed out that the Corinthians were very, very proud of their education. Every Corinthian thought that he was smart because he went to school of philosophy. Many people would say, well, if you're a Corinthian, you must be really smart. And he also said that the, the Corinthian church was probably the richest of all the churches that Paul had started at that time. Financially, they're doing well compared to the others. There was a persecution and suffering and poverty in many of the other churches, but not in Corinth. So many churches of the apostles were treated like trash. That's what he's saying. But in Corinth, the church that Paul founded, he was now being looked down upon by this current leadership. Paul was calling the members of the Corinthian church to, to imitate him, not the current leaders. And he reminded them they must teach, be teachers and guides speaking to them, but they must not forget <coughs> what Paul founded and, and they must obey exactly what he taught them. He called them to imitate him and his teachings rather than these false teachings. He reminded them that if their false teachers presented anything contrary to what he taught them, they must ignore it. 
And finally, he was telling them that he was on the way and he was coming and he gave them a choice. So at that time he was in Ephesus and he knew it would take a while to get to Corinth. He, had, he can't go straight across by sea for some reason. He, could jump. he wanted to jump in the boat and go over, but, it, but he didn't. And it took a long time before he gets there. And he's going to write the second letter on the way there. But he caused him to have to write the second letter, as we said. And then Father skipped over, for some reason, chapter 5. So we'll pick up next week with um, chapter 6 and continue on through 1 Corinthians. So I hope you've got this grasp. The beginning of what I was trying to share is that all of these things are the foundation for what we're learning in our catechism. All of these are that I'm teaching, that we're teaching in RCIA, in that wonderful book by Father Teresi, are coming out of these early documents, out of these early letters, out of this argument against the world. And, and they haven't changed for 2,000 years. Uh, I'm just utterly amazed. I went to Christendom College, a little bitty. We went into a, to, to a school that basically met in a former convent. It had about four rooms. We had a bunch of table and chairs. But we had some of the greatest scholars I've ever seen that came and talked to us. We had a world-class scholar in spirituality that Beverly studied under, who was a Dominican. Marvelous guy. Father De Laurenti taught us. Father Saunders taught us. Sister Timothy taught us. He was a Dominican nun. All PhDs. They were brilliant, brilliant teachers. And what did they teach? This message. The same thing that I'm... When I teach RCI, the reason I'm so confident in what I'm teaching is because everything I teach, I can document from a document in the Catholic Church. The Catechism, the Didache, the teaching of the uh, Apostolic Fathers, all the things that have been going on, I can show you where it came from. If I'm teaching something in RCI, I can go back to the source. It's not my opinion. I'm not teaching something off the top of my head. I'm not telling you something that made me feel good. It is the faith that has been there for 2,000 years. And you can take it to the bank, and it isn't going to change. And we need it now more than ever in a world that is diminishing all of this and just making it seem like nonsense. Old wives' tale. Who needs that? Well, we need that. It is God manifesting himself to his people. We are part of the people of God. Our descendants are the descendants of Abraham. We are children of Abraham. We are people of faith. And that's why I wanted to share that. I'll send those slides so you have those references. And if you get time, look at some of those things. Go back and read some of the fathers of the church. Go back and study the, the catechism. You don't have to read it word for word, but Look up things and get answers to questions, and everything is there is a wonderful index. You can find out the answer to anything in the catechism through the index. So if you really want to do it, go join Notre Dame Graduate School and get a degree in this stuff. I mean, I didn't do it till I was in my 60s, for Pete's sake. Promoting. So it's still there. Go. I even convinced Beverly. I'll tell you one last story. I came home one day. I was all excited to talk to Father De Laurenti. And he said, why don't you go to graduate school? And I said, well, I'm too old. And he said, my father became a deacon when he was your age. And he went back to graduate school and became a deacon. And I said, well, I think I'll, then I'll look into it. So I looked into it and I said, well, I think I'll do this. So I came home and I announced the following to Beverly. Guess what we are going to do? And she said, what? I said, we are going to graduate school and get our degree in Catholic theology. And she said, we? I haven't been to school in 30 years. I'm not interested in going to graduate school. I said, she said, I'll audit. I said, no, you won't. If you audit, you won't learn a darn thing. You're gonna take the course. You're gonna write the exams. You're gonna write the papers. You're gonna go through the whole nine yards that she lovingly submitted. Because all of our married life, the first 11 years, I never even asked her a question about Catholicism. She was very careful not to proselytize. She tried very hard not to criticize the Methodist, she never criticized the Methodist church. And she went to my church and I went to her church. But it wow. wasn't until I was in Korea and met this priest who challenged me. What in the world are you missing? Why don't you come and learn about this faith? And once I did that, Beverly was so happy that when I finally convinced her that we needed to go to graduate school, she did it as an act of love. Not because she needed it, because she had this foundation from her schooling when she was a child but she did it with me. So that became our date night for three years. We would go, we would go to graduate school and learn these courses. And it was just, it's just the, the rest is history. It became the DREs after that. And 
now I'm teaching. I'm just, I, at my age to have this mission is such a gift. And it comes from that hunger to find this truth. And that's why I wanted to share you with you that in the beginning. All right. So um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I do have some charts here. Glorious St. Raymond of Pendefort, wise and holy patron, come to the aid of those entrusted to your care and to all who flee to your protection. Intercede for us in our need. Help us through your prayers, example, and teaching to proclaim the truth of the gospel to all we meet. When we've reached the fullness of our years, we beseech you to guide us home to heaven, live in peace with our Mother Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now at the hour of our death, amen, Mary, friend of Christians, pray for us. Okay, does anyone um, oh. have any questions or comments? Or Wow, oh, we got a really good crowd here today. Wonderful. Anybody have anything you want to add? Yeah, Bob? Yes, yes. Monica, you want to ask? Yes, I just wanted to say that I too was raised with the Baltimore Catechism. And I just, uh, the phrase that really stuck out and to me, what you read today in Corinthians 3 was the temple of the Holy Ghost. I just remember I was the temple of the Holy Ghost. And, I've, you know, being a cradle Catholic, you hear those words so much. But because you have shown us here all of the stuff that the temple means, I mean, why were we called temple? And why, you know, a temple is the place where the Holy Spirit is. And, and, and you know, it's just, it's just, we, we, it's almost, it's almost a defect to have been a cradle Catholic because it doesn't, it, it's repetition that becomes ho-hum and uh, just delighted with, with how Paul is the theologian that set the structure and the structure was great. Well, I'm, I'm glad I, you know, they always say converts have the most, are, are most interested. We make a decision as an adult. I studied this as an adult. I got a master's degree in this as an adult and it's something I really wanted. Where a child, you go because your parents make you go. I, you know, the, the, the issue was if, if you could get through the eighth grade, you never have to come back to CCD again. So now we have a whole bunch of eighth grade Catholics out there. I mean, who would let their child jump out of school in the eighth grade because algebra was boring? We never let them do that. But parents all the time did that when we were DRE said, look, if I can get the sacrament of confirmation on this kid, then I'm letting him do whatever he wants. And that was the end of it. And so it's really exciting to see you all coming and having this hunger and having this desire to learn the scripture, which is the foundation of all this. And I'm trying to share with you what it means to me to be a Catholic so that you'll get excited too. I mean, you've got however many years left. You can just expand it immensely and continue to learn because of what's available out there to you. And now online, all this stuff that's available to us to go down and pull down and read and all the great speakers that you can listen to, it's really wonderful. Grad school is more wonderful because it's structured and you're trying to get an objective, get a degree. It makes it more intense. But there, if you don't have time to do all that, there's certainly so many things you can do. And it doesn't necessarily have to be to save other people. It makes you a better person. It makes you appreciate who you are and what God is and what he's asking you to do and what he's given to you. It's just the more I study, the more in awe I am of our faith. It's just, it's just magnificent. And I do feel sorry. For a long time, I thought the division between Protestantism and Catholicism was good because it sort of made us compete. You know, if you have competition, then both of you are trying to get better because you're competing with the other. I don't see that anymore. I see that as a great tragic loss of the fullness of the faith to so many good people who if they could be exposed to it, if they could meet good Catholics who have the faith and can explain it, may be more than willing to come and see. That's what happened to me. Come and see. That's what Jesus said to the apostles uh, after his baptism. Come and see. Come and see where I'm living. Come and see what the Catholic Church is. I love these converts in the RCI that are going to Mass now and sharing uh, with me their experiences of Mass and how they can't wait to, to be able to receive the sacraments. It's just beautiful to see them with their fiance or their or their spouse going to mass as a Protestant and then beginning to see what's available to them. It's just very, very exciting. Anyway, I'm carried away. I, I'll try to get enthusiastic next, next week. I'm sorry, it's so 
<laughs> Run down today. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Well, God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Remember, you, on Zoom, we're never canceled. Thank you so much, Bob. You're very Thank welcome. you, Bob. God bless. In the name of the Father. Okay, the end. All right.